this afternoon. Uh, we have Lowell Lee here with us from the Anderson Church that will be bringing us a lesson here in a few minutes. Josh Weber is visiting from the Moody Church. He'll be leading our singing. And uh, to start off, though, we'll start with a word of prayer. And uh, Jack Sanford will come up and lead that prayer. And at the close of services, Hunter will lead us in a, a closing prayer. Blessed are we to have you as our creator, our redeemer, and our savior. Help us, Lord, to clear the temporal things from our mind as we enter into this worship. And each one of us may be uplifted exhorted we pray for those who have health issues that your blessings be upon them and that they provide comfort and strength to them and their families help us Lord to be humble be more spiritually minded and to grow in love for one another and for our fellow man. We ask that you would help the leaders of our country Pray that they might seek wisdom from you. Lord, we're so thankful that we can come and worship you freely without fear of being persecuted. Help us to use the resources that you bless us with. to help those who are truly needy. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. I want to begin tonight um, by reading a verse from Colossians chapter 3. Here's what it says in Colossians chapter 3, in verses 12 and 13. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Here's the highlight. Bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Tonight, Lowell's going to be talking about forgiveness, and I think the title for that is How to Forgive, or something like that. And so I wanted to begin in our scene by talking about why we forgive. I'm a pretty visual learner, and so when I read this verse, I've got a picture in mind, and I almost brought a cup with me to, to show you. Uh, my wife jokingly tells me that all of her glassware has been used in sermon illustrations since 2012. <laughs> Um, but in my mind, what it is for to represent as God has forgiven you, so also you must forgive, is a cup that you just pour and pour and pour. And once you get past that point where the water starts cresting over the top of it, right, as it's just about to overflow, that's a very full life and a life full of forgiveness. But when I truly imagine God's forgiveness for us, 
It just keeps going and keeps spilling out and spilling over. That's why we have to forgive is because God has given us so much. When we imagine his forgiveness to us, it is immense. It is unending. And when that pours out of us, it pours out into the lives of those around us. We, in turn, forgive as he has forgiven us. So in our songs today, I want you to keep that picture of overflowing in mind. Now, I've been told that both of these songs are not on the, sl on the slides. Is that correct? Okay. Then, <laughs> he's looking at me like, I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to switch the songs because I want uh, to sing uh, Oh, Fill My Cup first. Because uh, I've been told you guys know that better. Okay, <laughs> we'll start there. But I want you to keep that picture in mind. Oh, fill my cup. Let it overflow. Let it overflow with love. This is God pouring into our lives and that, that we must also forgive. Let's sing this song together. Now we're going to sing verse 1, verse 2, which is the first verse of Amazing Grace. And then we'll simply go back and sing verse 1 again about filling my cup. Um, because we are overflowing God's grace in our lives. Right. I'll sing the bass because that's what is technically the lead. Go. Oh. favorite subjects in school. I thought it was fascinating. <laughs> Not. But this song is rooted in the geography of the Holy Lands, of Canaan. There are two large bodies of water, one at the north and one at the south, uh, connected by the Jordan. The one at the top is called the Sea of Galilee. Now technically the, the river starts above that, goes up to Lake Thula, comes down to the Sea of Galilee. And that sea, it's where you go fishing. It's where all of the apostles began their, their careers as fishermen because there's so much teeming life in it. But as the Jordan continues south, it gets to the lowest point on earth, the Dead Sea. And the difference is that the water comes to and through the Sea of Galilee, but it just stops at the Sea of the Dead Sea. And that's a great picture for our lives. If God's grace flows to us and through us, we too become teeming with life. But if we simply try to be reservoirs of God's grace and not forgiving others, guess what? We become like the sea which bears its name. The Dead Sea. So that's why this song is called There is a Sea, and that's the beautiful picture of grace flowing through us. After this song, Lowell's going to come present us our lesson. <coughs> There is a sea which day by day receives the rippling rills and streams that spring from wells of God, or fall from cedar hills. But what is Jesus. Yeah. 
very thankful that the newly appointed elders did not cancel the meeting as <laughs> their first order of business and uh, we continued the meeting so that's good and I'm glad to be here with you this afternoon now with the majority of you I know where you just came from <laughs> I got that Maybe I should preach on gluttony. <laughs> no, I'll, I'd be throwing rocks at myself. So if you have problems staying awake, if you'll hold both feet off the ground about this high, just hold them up off the ground about this high, you will not go to sleep. If you still have problems, we'll march around Jericho about <laughs> seven times. No. It's a little bit tough on Sunday afternoons when we've had a really nice meal and you come back and uh, sit in padded pews and air conditioning and uh, not doze a little. So uh, I'll try my best to keep you awake. I'll ask questions from time to time. So uh, audience participation will be encouraged. But uh, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. We have a few visitors. Uh, good to see the Millers here. They, they were out of their pew. I didn't know who they were. I asked who they were. Then I was embarrassed when they told me. Uh, I know these folks. <laughs> um, they've been down here for is it a year. You've been here a year? Okay. Um, we're up in the Florence area. Know uh, their family and um, appreciate them very, very, very much. So good to see you today. You may recall in the scriptures, and it's recorded in John 7, verse 46, that um, um, the Jews sent some men to arrest Jesus. And when they got there, they listened to him. They came back empty-handed. And the Jews wanted to know, well, why didn't you arrest him? This is what one said. No one ever spoke like this man. So what is interesting here, you have the enemies of Christ listening to him. And they were amazed. When you read the words of God, you read things that are profound, that strike you as just wow. This afternoon's lesson is going to be like that. Because what we read from Scripture about what Jesus said. For if you forgive men for their transgressions, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now, if you let that soak a minute, I've done a lot of preaching through the years on the forgiveness of God. Not long ago, 
a lady came up to me after I had preached on forgiveness, and she came up to me and she said, um, she asked, how do we forgive those that sin against us? And I replied, you just do it. And I felt really proud of myself. <laughs> and she looked at me with, with disgust. And she said, that's what all of you preachers say. And she walked off. Well, I soon gathered that that was not a sufficient answer for her. But then I got to thinking about that. And thought about it a lot. And I thought, man, that was a terrible answer. What is the answer? So I did a little work. Now I've preached this, this sermon several times since then. And I wish I could remember who that woman was and where that was so I could give her a better answer. So I'm hoping if I keep preaching this sermon enough, I'll, I'll catch her somewhere. <laughs> but Jesus said, if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. <clears throat> and he continues and says, but if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, however many times you've read the Bible, however many sermons you've had, however many Bible classes you've set in, that particular thought process is one that really challenges each of us. Because I believe all of us need forgiveness. You agree? We all need forgiveness. But Jesus makes it contingent upon us forgiving others. So I might think of myself as a forgiving person. But I think we'd have to do more than just a superficial examination of ourselves. We'd have to really, really start thinking about that pretty deeply. While we may not claim an enemy, my guess is you have one. And while you may not claim that there are people that you don't particularly like when they've done something to hurt you or offend you, if you think about it, you probably still hold it against them. That's what we're going to talk about. So it is painful. It is hurtful. It is challenging. But it is necessary. It is essential. Because I want to be forgiven and I want to go to heaven. Is that true with you? You want to be forgiven? You want to go to heaven? Then we need to think about it. So, what I think is interesting, um, we can just turn here briefly to Revelation 12, verse 10. And I want to notice a couple of categories here for you that might um, challenge us as well. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. Well, that's Satan. Satan is the accuser of mankind before God. Do you recall, Job? Remember the scene? The conversation between God and Satan. Did not Satan accuse God concerning Job? Well, you put a hedge around him. You protected him. No wonder he serves you faithfully. Look what you've done for him. Take all that away from him and he'll, he'll curse you. And God says, go for it. Put a couple of boundaries on it. And Job continued to serve God. And through all that he was tested, he didn't sin against God. My point is this. There are those who accuse. And then 
there are those that forgive. And our God is full of compassion and ready to forgive. So I, I might just start off by asking us, our, ourselves, of which category are we? I think, <clears throat> I think it becomes very easy for us to accuse, to point the finger at. But it's a much different story to be able to forgive. So forgiveness, it's a beautiful thing. I love talking about forgiveness. But it's difficult. So if I was to ask you the question, is it easy or a hard thing? I think it's a hard thing. But it's hard to forgive. Now, if you sin against me, for me to forgive you, that's going to be tough. I have to think about it. If I sin against you, it's not a big deal. Just get over it. <laughs> right? And I will say this. Women are much better forgivers than men are. You think about that. God's forgiveness is because God is love. Notice in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, God is love. There is a difference between saying God loves and God is love. The very essence of who God is, is he is love. And because of that, he forgives. It's important you get the connection here. So I'm a teacher, so I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you what I told you. You know, repetition, repetition, repetition. If you don't forgive, you don't love. If you do forgive, you love. That's the short of it. So God is love. He forgives. And he remembers our sins against us no more. I do not think that we have the capability of, for, of, of remembering no more. I remember that Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And one of those sons' names, he named it such because my God has caused me to forget. What did he have to forget? I was treated by his family, his brothers, sold into bondage, etc. Do you think he actually forgot it? No, when his brothers wound up down in Egypt, and at the end, he reminds them, I know what you did, and what you did was bad. And you're scared that I'm going to do something about that. Take revenge. Joseph just simply says, look, I know what you did was bad, but it was God's plan. God wanted me here. He used you doing a bad thing to get me here. And I'm here and I'm going to save your scheme. God's plan. So Joseph could, could hardly be mad at his brothers of what they did to him because... It was God's plan. But nonetheless, God remembers our sins no more. Can you forgive and forget? <clears throat> That's divine. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 32, as we read a moment ago, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. There, there's a couple different takes on this passage, and I'm, I'm not going to take the time to go into all of that, but simply say this. I think God has forgiven us. The, the wrath of God has been turned away from us because of the blood of his Son. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, the wrath of God would consume us all because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But because of that blood, we've been forgiven. Well, we should be willing to forgive others too, just like God in Christ forgave us. Do not allow your wrath to burn against someone. Forgive them. But how do we forgive? How do you do that? 
I will say this just so that you understand. Forgiveness is very difficult. I preached this sermon a few times. And it's been interesting the reactions I've gotten from people. I've had on an occasion or two older women, mature ladies, come up to me and say, I really appreciated your sermon. When I was young, a family member molested me. And I've never forgiven them. Now, I, I didn't ask for that. I didn't need to know that. But here's what's interesting about that. The word of God touched their hearts. And for all of these decades, they have kept in their hearts a grudge, an anger. And they realized they needed to get rid of that. Do you understand the, import the importance of that? When we're unwilling to forgive, does, does the time erase it? It's still there. The first thing that I learned about forgiveness and how to forgive comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. If you have your Bibles, take a look at that just for a moment. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5. We made reference to 1 Corinthians 13 this morning. Um, I think we read through that a bit, maybe. Um, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, it says, Do not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. does not take into account a wrong suffered. That particular word in the original language has to do with, it's an accounting term. It means that you actually keep a ledger, that you, eat, that you write it down. Well, in 1963, you said this. Then in 64, you did this. And you keep a book, and you write that, and you remember all of those offenses. You're not erasing them out of your book. You're remembering them. That's that word. Now, notice the connection of what love is. So, if someone sins against you, what is God expecting us as a disciple to do? To love the offender. What does that mean? You cannot take into account the wrong suffered. This morning we discussed briefly the Good Samaritan. The fact that that Samaritan, whatever had been done to him by the Jews because of the hatred, did not prevent him or keep him from showing compassion to that man. That's love. Secondly, you release the offender from your punishment. If someone does us wrong, what do we do? Okay, two-lane highway. I decided to take the scenic tour from the hotel over here rather than interstate. I got to looking at the time, and I was taking a little bit too much scenic tour time. And I'm thinking, oh, I better hurry up. Somebody's driving slow in front of me. You ever had anybody to drive slow in front of you when you were in a hurry? How does it make you feel? You start singing praises. Oh, how I love this person in front of me. Oh, how I love this person in front of me. Right? No, we think bad things. Get off the road, you Sunday driver. Then if you get a chance to pass, what do you do? Slow down, go slower than they were going. Now, what do you call all of that? Love, <laughs> forgiveness, not taking into account a wrong suffered, right? <laughs> now, that's the furthest thing from your mind. Romans chapter 12, notice what the text here says. Paul makes mention of this kind of uh, action and so forth. Verse 17, he says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. I 
was driving south, going down south from my home in Rogersville, out on one of the old country roads, real early Sunday morning, and uh, nobody, this long stretch, and this old guy, he's in an old uh, farm beat up flatbed, and you know, there's nobody around anywhere. He's going probably 35 miles an hour, 55 mile an hour zone. I go around him, you know, and as I get right up over, I look over at him, and he gives me the finger. I think he was saying happy Sunday, happy Lord's Day, I'm not sure. But I'm thinking, you know what? No, I didn't do anything back. I didn't say I didn't think anything back. <laughs> but why do people do what they do? This passage says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. I don't know what that guy was doing. He may have just been coming home from getting drunk all night last that night. I don't know. Whatever. But I must control myself. And the Lord will take care of that. We try to make the golden rule. Do unto others as they have done unto you. Or really, sometimes we do. Do unto them before they get a chance to do it. Forgiveness. Release the offender in your punishment. Do not retaliate against them in any way. Also, it's the very idea that you do good to the offender. Verse 20, 21. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Really? If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, that goes against our human nature, if you will. It goes against everything that seems to be within us. I grew up in a place where I had a neighborhood, and there was lots and lots and lots of uh, kids, and there's a bunch of guys my age, and we go out every day, and... Uh, we play baseball, we play football, then we fight. Then we play baseball, then we play football, then we fight. And then, you know, just that way all the time. And pretty much the, 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 the rule of the hood was that if, um, you know, you end the fighting period, uh, I guess that was our, our hockey, I don't know. But anyway, um, during the fighting period, uh, you know, if a, if a kid hit you, and on a scale of one to 10, it may be a two or a three. Well, we call him a sissy, call him a girl, something like that. But, you know, we're not going to let him get away with a two or a three. On a scale of one to ten, we're going to, you know, hit him about a 14. Back. Now, you grow up thinking that way. You know, to be a man, you can't be a sissy. Then you become a Christian. How do we react to other people? Somebody says something ugly to you, you're going to fire back and just bury it with something. If somebody sins against you, do good to the offender. Don't celebrate the offender's failures. I've done this, I'm ashamed of myself, it's wrong. I guess I was driving too slow on a country road. Somebody passes me. They're going really, really fast. What did I mention? It's a double yellow line and they pass and you're hoping the cops catch me. If there's ever that rare time that they're off the side of the road, a cop's got them pulled over and you drive by, don't you want to slow down and roll down the window and go... Gotcha. Well, that's per exactly what you're not supposed to do. Because if you forgive those that sin against you, 
then you don't celebrate their failures. You treat the offender with the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. So, you sin against someone. You ask them to forgive you. They say they forgive you. How do you want them to treat you? You want them to mention it and rub it in every once in a while? What is the old saying? Bury the hatchet. Keep the handle sticking out. What do you keep the handle sticking out for? Well, you might need it someday. Reach down there and grab it and walk them over the head again with it. Oh, well, that's been forgiven. Yeah, but I decided to bring it up again. You know, we, we, we do that sort of thing. Husband-wife relationship, parent-child relationship, brother-to-brother. -brother. No wonder churches have problems. Churches would be absolutely perfect as the Lord intended if it didn't have any people in it. <laughs> but churches have people. And guess what? Churches are not perfect. So we must learn to forgive. Stop dwelling on the past offense. If somebody does you something wrong, you think about it, you think about it, you think about it, you think about it. And the more times you think about it, it just gets you more angry, it gets you more upset. And you start thinking more evil, and you think of, you just start thinking the way you shouldn't think. Have you ever stopped to think about this one? Saul of Tarsus, he persecuted Christians, did he not? He had Christians put in jail, did he not? He becomes a Christian, becomes Paul the Apostle. And all his journeys, do you think he ever ran into any body, family? Can you just imagine him going to Ephesus, uh, going to Corinth? And while he's there and he's preaching, I mean, all the times I'm preaching and teaching in different places, I always run into somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. So Paul's preaching there, and up walks someone, and they say, my name is so-and-so. I know you don't know me, but you know my uncle. Uh, when you were saw of Tarsus, you went and arrested his whole family because they were Christians. You took away all of their possessions. You put them in jail. And then they were put to death because they believed in Jesus. That was my uncle. How do you think Paul feels now? Now, I don't know for certain that that happened. I'm just saying. How would Paul have reacted? He talked about it in Philippians chapter 3. He says, forgetting the things that were behind. I press on toward the things of the upper call of Christ. I've often thought how difficult it must have been for Paul to forgive himself for what he had done. Have you ever done anything that you haven't forgiven yourself. A past offense. God's forgiven you. The brethren have forgiven you. But you've not forgiven you. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. I'm convinced that discouragement, depression, a lack of self-worth is some of the devil's greatest weapons against us. If he can get you to think for a moment that you're just not worth anything or that you just can't do it. I've had Christians to tell me. Brother Salih, I, I loved your sermon. I, I, I think what you preached is the truth, but I just can't do that. I, I just, I, I'm just not capable of doing that. I think there are a lot of brethren that feel that way. God, God has never asked of us anything that we can't do. 
It's just that we don't have a lot of want to. And maybe, maybe God is wanting us to jump this high. And maybe I can only jump this high. I jump as high as I can. And I think the grace of God and the compassion of God and the mercy of God and the justice of God and all those other beautiful words of the Bible make up the difference. But you have to try to do your best. But the thing that will keep you from doing your best is when you feel sorry for yourself. And maybe you say things like this. You say, why did this happen to me? My mother-in-law found out she had cancer. Fifteen years later, it took her life. Well, when she first found out she had cancer, we were all at the hospital. She was having surgery. And my father-in-law asked the question. He said, my wife is the most godly person he ever knew. And of all these wicked people that there are in the world, why did God let her get cancer? You ever ask this kind of question? Me too. And what it does, it, it creates doubt in your mind. And here's, here's where that question was first asked. It was asked by Satan to Eve. Did God say that in the day that you eat of that fruit, you shall surely die? Is that what he said? God knows that in the day that you eat, was he implying? He was implying that God had kept back something good from them. And she was deceived into thinking that if she ate of that fruit, she'd be better. Isn't that what temptation is about? Is the devil is tempting you that you're missing something. You haven't gotten all the pleasure and the good and the excitement that you need and that you can have. And God's trying to keep that from you. But if you just go ahead and give in and sin, then wow, you're going to be on this, this higher plateau of just awesomeness. Now, I said all that to say this. God loves you very much. And he has blessed each of us with far more than we ever could possibly deserve. And he causes the rain upon the just and the unjust. And when bad and evil comes to your house, God ain't picking on you. It's the world we live in. Bad things happen to good people. Joe. Forgiveness. Remember when Jesus talked to his disciples and the disciples said, Lord, how, how many times should I forgive my brother? Up to seven times? Jesus said, no, not up to seven times, but to 70 times seven. I think that's 490, right? That 490? So on 491, the deal's off. 491. Deal's off. You think that's what he's talking about? I don't either. I think that it's hyperbole to simply suggest to us that as many times as your brother sins against you, you need to forgive him. How many times has God forgiven you? 490? At least. Is God still forgiving? So should we. Forgiveness is the power that breaks the chains of bitterness and anger. I'm going to tell you a little story here that might help you to understand where I'm coming from and why I really work hard to think about this lesson. 
23 years ago, this past April, my father shot and killed his mother, or his wife, my mother, and then he killed himself. When I got that news, I was devastated. I was preaching at Jordan Park. I didn't have a clue who, what, where, when, and why, or nothing. I didn't know how to react to that. I'm not a crier. Never have been a crier. I've done tons of funerals in my life. Felt like I needed to cry and couldn't cry and didn't cry. That's painful. But I started crying profusely. Buried my hopes. 23 years later, I still don't know why. I don't know why it happened. But I'll tell you what it did for me for a long time. It made me bitter. And it made me angry. I'm a gospel preacher. My parents are Christians. They do that. It was embarrassing. I didn't know how to answer people. I didn't know how to. Did, constantly I was asked, well, did you ever find out why? No. So I found out for a number of years I was angry and bitter. I told you that personally, the personal thing, to tell you this. There are a lot of Christians who are bitter and angry. And all you have to do is listen to them five minutes and you can tell they are. I'm going to tell you what a really good chance of the problem being. You ain't forgiven somebody. You're holding it. And you know what not forgiving does to you? cancer. It'll kill you. I don't know nothing about nobody. I want to keep it that way. <laughs> but here's my point. Emotions are good. Emotions are bad. You can do things that are wrong way and your emotions <coughs> will hold you captive. And you cannot have the peace and the joy that God offers through his son because you will not let go. It sets you free from the shackles of your own prison. I could not forgive my dad. I don't know why he did it. To me, it didn't matter. He did it. Motive? I don't know. He did it. He killed my mother. And finally, I just had to to say. I just said the words out loud. I forgive you. Here's the catch. Here's the ringing around the rosy that brethren will play. Well, he didn't ask for no forgiveness. You can't forgive him if you don't ask for it. He's dead. What am I doing now? otherwise. When a person dies, your fate is sealed. I just pray that he was out of his mind. God knows. God will judge. It was out of my control, out of my hands. I can't even ask him to repent. 
What choice did I have? I was tired of being angry. I was tired of being bitter. It was killing me. Stone Hart wrote this, and I thought it appropriate, and I wanted to apply it in this lesson. No one leaves a family without breaking someone else's heart. No one leaves the church without breaking someone else's heart. The church is a family, not a business. Jesus wants us to be a family, not customers. When there's a problem, work it out. I often thought about my mom and dad. Through the years, I was their counselor. They looked up to me. They loved me very dearly. I can't, I can't even begin to give them a number of the times that I talked to them about issues. And there, I'm a preacher, young preacher at that at times, at the time. Um, family counseling my mom and dad. Talk about weird. That was weird. They didn't ask about that. It happened. I often wondered why they didn't work it out. Do you know what happens to us when we're overcome with our emotions against one another and we're unwilling to work it out? You know what happens? You die. Churches die. Brethren die. And we're talking about being lost. Oh, I've forgiven them, but I'll never forget what they did to me. They hurt me so badly, I want nothing to do with them ever. You ever said that? Me too. I don't want to be anywhere near them. Forgiveness doesn't excuse the I've forgiven my dad, and incidentally, for all it's worth, I've forgiven my mother too. My mother was a godly woman, but for some reason or another, she knew the right button to push on my dad. She knew how to say and do something that just caused him to go berserk. He had never been physical with my mother, ever, but he had been angry. They, they used language with each other they shouldn't have. They were angry with each other like they shouldn't have. And, and I've concluded that, you know, you can only take so much of that and it builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up. Angry words. Oh, let them never. Why? Forgive my mother and my father. But that doesn't excuse the behavior. They'll answer to God for that. Forgiveness prevents their behavior from destroying your heart. I'd answer that lady a lot different this time. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your transgressions. So here's what I'd like to leave with you in regards to this important lesson. The next time you get ready to pray, pause just a moment and ask yourself a very simple question. Is there anyone 
I have sent him a gift. God knows. If there is, forgive him. Then ask God to forgive you. Mark Twain, he was quoting an asylum inmate. Forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds. Violet sheds on the heel of his crushed feet. Who stomped the flower, but the flower leaves a fragrance of sweet smell to me. Does that describe us? Forgiveness is a beautiful thing. The gospel is the power of God to say, to forgive us. But may I very humbly suggest something to all of us. I can be forgiven of my sins through the blood of Christ. But I must come to understand the love I must have for others to forgive others as I have been forgiven. We don't understand that. I think we're in trouble. Thank you for listening. I appreciate so very, very much your kind attention. Uh, the lesson is um, hard. I think the lesson is needed. It was for me. And wherever that poor sister is, I hope she gets the answer to her question. <coughs> And if you're that lady, would you mind telling me that? <laughs> that will ease my mind a lot. His grace reaches me. If you need to obey the gospel or have prayers for the brethren here, why don't you come as we stand and say? Deeper than the ocean and wider.
Again, it was good to be out tonight, Lowell. Thank you. Powerful and much needed lesson. Somebody said last night, I said, Lowell's going to preach how to forgive. I said, oh, I don't know that I've ever heard a lesson, how to forgive. And I was like, yeah, it'll be a good one. I'm sure it'll be a real easy. Here's how to forgive. Boom. Oh, a magic potion of some kind. It wasn't, it wasn't that easy. And, of course, we can't expect things to be easy. Some things are easier than others. But uh, a lot of things take work. And Jesus, of course, has taught us that. Come back and be with us Monday night, tomorrow night at 7, Tuesday night at 7, uh, Wednesday night at 7 if, if you can. I uh, appreciate Josh last minute. Uh, basically that I asked him to lead singing. Um, I knew that I was not personally feeling up to it myself. I was going to and just happened to say, hey, you're not coming to 3 o'clock service this afternoon, are you? His response to which was, didn't even know there was a 3 o'clock service this afternoon. <laughs> I said, there is, and if you happen to come, I'd love for you to lead singing. <laughs> so the next thing I know, he was picking out a song, so I appreciate doing that at the last minute, Josh. Um, matter of fact, last night I asked Lowell if he'd be here uh, this t today, and he said, oh, is, it, is that tomorrow? So <laughs> appreciate the last minute getting these lessons together. <laughs> um, good to have the, our visitors. Hope that you can all come back and be with us at another time. We meet regularly Sunday mornings at 9.30 for Bible class, 10.30 for assembly, and regular midweek Bible study Wednesday nights at, at 7 p.m. Um, Got a flyer. The church at the 157 congregation in Coleman is having a ladies' day September 30th with Cindy Malone, whose husband is Alan Malone, who they're up in the uh, Nashville vicinity. And uh, I'll put that flyer on the bulletin board, and maybe some of y'all can go up and support that uh, uh, that endeavor. Oh, the men for the ladies' day. The men will be serving lunch at the gun range behind the building. So that's something you don't see often on a <laughs> church flyer. But, you know, that's cool. Um, any announcements that need to be made before we dismiss tonight, Mike? Yeah, there's a card right back over here for Mallory, Tired Wife. Is, everyone, Is it for Mallory or for Harley? Okay, I can't hear anything. So there's a card in the back. Yes. Be sure to get with somebody and uh, <laughs> and, and sign that uh, and, and figure out what that's for. Somebody can tell me later because I can hear what you're saying. <laughs> um, what else? Okay. Um, and Maddie has COVID. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, Maddie did a home test after leaving today and it was positive for for COVID. So keep her in your prayers. And Christy was not feeling well yesterday. She took a test too and it was negative. So we're just hoping that we're just hoping for good things. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Hunter will be leading us in prayer and if there's nothing else then Hunter. Join me in a word of prayer, please. Most gracious and loving Father, we're so thankful for the gift of today and of these assemblies that you've allowed us to have. Father, we're so thankful for Brother Josh and for his willingness to, on such short notice, assemble with us and lead song. We're thankful for Brother Lowell and his willingness to travel here to be with us these four days to lead these gospel meetings. Father, we pray that all of our efforts here would be pleasing to you and that everything would be done in truthfulness and in earnestness and with the sole intent to glorify your holy name. Father, we pray for blessings for Lowell that he may continue to serve the way he does. Father, I'm thankful for everyone who is here tonight, especially visitors. What a blessing it is to have them amongst us this evening. Father, thank you for keeping us all safe as we travel here and I pray for safety for us all when we depart. 
Father, I pray your healing hand be upon those of our number who are sick and in poor health. We pray that if it's your will, that their health would be restored to them. But Father, if that is not your will, may you be praised all the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.